Hello, I'm Luca Torix, and welcome to my Sicily faction guide for Medieval 2 Total War. Today we'll be discussing the faction of Sicily, their position on the campaign map, and also some details about their units, you know, strategy, and so on and so forth. So, Sicily is the region highlighted in white on the map. It covers the southern sort of tip of Italy, and also the whole of Sicily. So that's a pretty good starting point. I actually quite like Sicily's starting position. They are a very defensible region on the island of Sicily itself, and then they're a bit protected by the Pope kind of in this region, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Their strengths are they can field strong militia, Norman knights, and Muslim archers. Their weaknesses lack good late period cavalry. So there you go. And to win the grand campaign, you have to hold 45 regions, including the Jerusalem region. So I think to start off with, we should have a look at some of their units. So here are the Sicilian units, and we're going to start off, like we always do, with peasants. And peasants are... Well, they're not amazing by any stretch of the imagination. Attack 4, Defense 3, poor morale. Really, they're a very unorganized and not particularly effective in combat. So, I would never rely on them in battle, let's put it that way. Then we have Italian militia. Local militias play an important role in Italian armies. These troops are armed with short spear and shield. And they will do a good job in the early game. I would say they do a pretty solid defensive job. 7 attack, 9 defense. Combat bonus in woods, which isn't particularly relevant, but they are a decent defensive unit with a spear, perfectly competent at holding cities uh, or villages or whatever in the early game. So, you know, decent unit, but obviously they become redundant after time because they lack that sort of armour or particularly strong attack that better units will obviously have. Then we get on to the Sword and Buckler Men. Oh, lovely. Superior swordsmen wearing light armour and open helmet and armed with a double-edged sword and buckler. 13 attack, 19 defense, so significantly better than what we just looked at, uh, by the way. Bit of an odd order, I would have thought they would have showed all the spearmen together first, but whatever. Good morale, good stamina, a pretty damn solid unit. I like my swordsman units. This is obviously a much more offensive unit than what we just saw with the um, Italian militia, but they, are, they will do a very, very good job in defense as well because they've got that good armor and all of that, you know. But it is open helmet, so a little bit odd. Then we go on to the Pike Militia, if I click on it properly. So, Pike Militia. Now, a little bit disorganised. Attack 7, defence with only 1. They are very, very... Well, they have very, very poor defence. But they can form a Spear Wall, which kind of boosts their defence a little bit, just by virtue of the fact they are harder to physically get and sort of penetrate through the line. They have a bonus fighting cavalry, which is sort of synonymous with a lot of spearmen and pikemen and so on and so forth. And they have very long spears, which, as I've discussed before, makes it even more difficult to penetrate the line, particularly, of course, with your cavalry. And it means they are more, they are safer because units are physically further away from them. So, defense of one, it might look bad, but isn't quite as bad because they have the spear wall. Then we move on to Sergeant Spearmen, trained and hardened warriors, protected by a large shield, armed with spears, and able to form a defensive ring of spears. So, Relatively similar, they can do a skill trim, attack of seven, defense of nine, but they have so they have a better sort of natural defense. They haven't got the long spears, but again, they are very, very solid defensive unit, particularly in the early game. They will do a good job and they are just tough to get to. If you get if you put them in a nice sort of defensive position, whether that be on the wall or tight city streets, particularly cavalry and stuff, they're gonna find it hard to get past, and they will do a good job in that respect in the early game. And then we move on to Italian Spear Militia. Again, a relatively similar unit. 7 attack, 13 defense. And again, they've got a sort of nice defensive ring. Not a huge amount more to say about these guys as opposed to these lads, but just a slightly better defensive version. And they will do, again, a very, very solid job at holding settlements in particular in the early game. Then we have Armoured Sergeants. Now, these guys have got a large shield and mail. They're armed with spears and able to form a defensive ring, blah, blah, blah. So again, pretty solid defense, a slight step up from the Italian Spear Militia. Very, very solid, and that's because they've got that better armor, they've got that better shield, and it's evidence there. You can see they're physically better if you look at the picture. And that, bon that bonus that the armor will give you will really give you a great opportunity to sort of defend yourself against the onslaught of the enemy, again, particularly in the early game. They aren't amazing, they haven't got a particularly potent attacking force, but this isn't a particularly offensive unit, so that's kind of what you would live to expect. Then we have Halberd Militia. So, these guys are armed with a halberd, you can see there, it's kind of like an axe thing, and it's used to fend off cavalry, 
pierce or crush armor. Now their attack is only five, their defense is only one, but I do quite like the fact that they are effective against armor. Now, a lot of these early game units, particularly the defensive ones, aren't effective against armor because, you know, they're not particularly amazing, they haven't got the technology or whatever. These guys have got very long spears, and they are effective against armor, so actually not too bad if you use them effectively, because there will be some units that are very hard to defeat by virtue of the fact they've got armor. And these guys can crush the armor with their big old axes, and make them a lot more vulnerable as a result. Now, admittedly, in the early game anyway, there's not going to be a huge amount of units with armor, so that should be kind of irrelevant, but if you do come across a faction, that is pretty well technologically advanced, then Halberd Militia can actually be pretty decent. So don't be too put off by the stats, because any unit that can eliminate armour in this game is a pretty good unit in my eyes. And then we'll move on to the Dismounted Men at Arms. Dismounted, these men are effective and well-protected infantry. 11 defense, sorry, 11 attack, 21 defense. So they're not joking when they say they're well protected. And that's because they're very well armored. Again, you can see that from the picture. They've got a pretty badass shield and armor and all that. They look like a kind of knight of the age and all that. 21 defense is very, very solid indeed for any stage of the campaign. 21 defense uh, is good indeed. But they've also got a, a more sort of attacking field to them. Swordsmen are generally more attacking units anyway. And these guys will do a pretty solid job indeed. You can see they are indeed a step up from the sword and buckler men. Not a huge amount, but they are they are a step up, I would I would believe. Then we have the dismounted broken lances. Well trained and experienced professional soldiers, protected by plate mail, armed with swords. 11 attack, 22 defense. Again, very well armoured. Uh, in fact, good stamina. Unfortunately, not got good morale. That would be sort of the, the cherry on top, the icing on the cake. But, pretty solid guys again. They've, I like to have an offensive unit that also has good defense. It means you can charge them in and not worry too much if they get sort of in a sort of prolonged slugging match against the enemy front line. So that's nice to see as well. And then we also have the dismounted Norman Knights. Exceptional Knights, even when dismounted, armed with swords and mail. 13 attack, 21 defense, so slightly better on the old attack. When armored, good morale, and that's exactly what I was just saying, the good morale would just be the cherry on top, and well, guess what, this is exactly what they have got. The good morale means they can really fight for a long time, they're not going to break, and again, even more so, you don't have to worry about them too much if they get into an old slugging match with the enemy. They can just chop them down all day, and they'll be perfectly happy, which is good, that's exactly what you want from your heavy infantry. And of course, that's what the game said at the beginning, they have some good Norman knights. Well, guess what, they're not joking. So we're going to move on to the archers now, we're going to start off with peasant archers like we always do. The peasant archers, not amazing, but they will do a certainly an alright job in the early game. Not in the melee, obviously, attack of 2 and defense of 1. But a missile attack of 5, nothing amazing, but if you put them from a height, if you have them with a the flaming missile, they can cause some morale damage and so on and so forth. You know they can shut down siege towers and all of that because they can set them on fire. I mean, nothing amazing, but okay in the early game. So after peasant archers are arquebusiers, which I think I'm finally actually saying right. Who knows? Either way, they're obviously a step up from the peasant archers. If you look at the peasant archers, five missile attack. These guys, 14 missile attack. And that's basically because they're, well, they're carrying a, like a rifle thing, right? So they're good at close range. But the their particularly good thing about them is that their, their noise and smoke damage, like it says there, causes morale damage. Um, which is just as useful sometimes as physical hurt, like it says there. Because, you know, it's going to make units break quicker. If unit breaks, then they're just going to get absolutely destroyed. So, they're not a very long range. In fact, these guys are longer range. They're not a very long range unit, but they're kind of very, very effective in reducing morale and causing a large amount of damage in a short amount of time. So they can be very effective in the short term. And also, compared to peasant archers, they're all right in the melee for a missile unit as well. Six and three attack and defense respectively, as opposed to two and one. Then we have the Pavis crossbowmen. These troops are armed with a large shield to protect them during the slow process of reloading their crossbow. And that is a good thing. If you look at a lot of archers in this game, it will say vulnerable to missiles, which is kind of ironic, I suppose. But these guys, that's not a that's not a problem. And that can be really useful, in fact. The long, you know, keeping your crossbowmen up alive during the fight, increasing their longevity can be very, very effective indeed. Six on the attack is pretty decent for a missile unit but 14 melee defense is very very solid indeed 
And that is very, very high for a missile troop on Medieval Two Toads War. And also a missile attack of 12. And they have a much longer range than the Arquebusier. So a much more dynamic unit that is also a little bit effective in the melee as well. Certainly won't be churned up in the melee, that's for sure. A quite a diverse unit, particularly for a missile troop. I quite like these guys a lot. Then we have the Pavese Crossbow Militia. Italian Crossbow Militia armoured with male and a Pavese. Honestly, pretty much the same uh, from, from what I can tell, but their bow looks smaller, so well, unlucky them, I suppose. Then we have Muslim archers. Troops comprised of Sicilian Muslims fighting for their city, equipped with bows and light armour. What you've noticed about these guys probably is their missile attack isn't particularly high, not in comparison to the Pavese troops, but their melee attack and defense is again pretty damn decent for a melee troop. A melee attack of 11, sorry, missile troop. A melee attack of 11 is pretty solid indeed, and that increases their sort of diversity and usefulness in battle. What of course you'll find often is once a unit, a missile unit, runs out of its ammo, it becomes redundant and useless. Well, not necessarily these guys, and it also means you don't have to protect them quite as much in battle. They're not as much of a liability anyway. Then we have hand gunners. Earliest handheld firearm unit causes more fear than actual damage. These soldiers need to be capable in close combat due to the short range of their weapons. So kind of similar to the Arquebusiers in that respect, but they're actually better in the melee. Their missile attack is 13, which if you compare it to the Arquebusiers is slightly worse. But again, these troops are a lot about morale damage. Um, the short range ones that have a lot of smoke and noise are more about morale damage than actual physical damage, which again, as I mentioned earlier, can be really useful in the battle. So, let's have a look at the cavalry now. We start off with mounted sergeants. These veteran warriors wear light armor and are armed with a spear and sword. Nine attack, 13 defense, no noticeable traits, but pretty decent starting stats for early period cavalry. Then we move on to cavalry militia. Now these guys have better defense because as the game says there, it is, they are encased in mail, which you know, that extra armor, their well armored trait makes them much more defensible. They're gonna be less vulnerable to missiles and stuff like that. So these guys are basically pretty similar, but more defense because they have, you know, better armor versions of the mounted sergeants, which are, which are pretty cool indeed. So I quite like them. It's nice to have cavalry that is not a liability on the battlefield. Then we have mailed knights, and relatively similar. I think they have a better attack if I am, uh, yeah, they do have a better attack indeed. And a charge bonus of six is pretty cool. These guys, once they get their lances down, can really cause a lot of damage um, as a sort of shock charge into the side or rear of particularly infantry in battle. Their good morale and good stamina though, makes them even better because they can then proceed to kill without routing in a sort of long slugging match if that is what it takes particularly against more hardy units that maybe aren't going to break to a big charge even if it's a pretty decent cavalry unit that's charged into them and then of course we move on to the general's bodyguard this is the early period general's bodyguard 13 attack 16 defense eight charge bonus obviously these guys are going to be good because they're protecting the general good morale powerful charge of of eight is good i mean it's even better than the last cavalry we just looked at well armored and very good stamina very very good cavalry but obviously you want to use them a little bit sparingly because the general is in that unit you don't particularly want him to die and then of course the late period pretty much similar but i think they have even better armor and they just look a little bit more badass which is very very important is more importantly the horse looks more badass which is the most important thing right then we'll move on to Norman Knights, exceptionally fierce knights wearing heavy mail and equipped with sturdy lances. And you can see that, 13 attack, 17 defense. They're more comparable to the General's Bodyguard, but they've got double the amount of men in the units. That's even cooler. Um, good morale, well armored, very good stamina, much like the General's Bodyguard. But also, they may charge out orders. Now, I think that's a pretty, that's, you know, it's kind of rare for them to do that, but then again, the AI in Rome, uh, sorry, Medieval Two Total War isn't exactly amazing at the best of times. You know, they can kind of just do their own thing. They do to me anyway. Maybe they don't like me. So it may charge out orders. Could be a bit annoying. But at least with a 17 defense, they aren't going to be too vulnerable if they are stupid enough to do that. Then we move on to Knights Templar. Some say they are reckless, but they are elite as well. Formed to protect the Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. 13 attack, 16 defense, 8 charge. I mean, 
The stats pretty much speak for themselves, uh, and so do the traits. These guys look badass. They're fighting for their religion. I always say this. If a unit's fighting for their religion, they're going to stand up, fight that a little bit harder, and that a little bit longer. And the Knights Templar certainly do that. Then we have the Knights Hospitalier. And again, they're, they're you know really strong guys. And I don't really have to reiterate the same points over and over again. Look at the stats. They're good. Then we'll move on to the Chivalric Knights, and again, very, very similar. Uh, elite Warriors clad in steel plate armor. These men pack a ferocious charge while being hard to kill. Well summarized, Medieval 2. Now, they don't have a lot of missile cavalry. This is not a particularly missile cavalry based faction, but they do have mounted crossbowmen. Using smaller crossbows than the infantry, these units use their mobility to stay out of trouble when they reload, and that's quite cool. Missile attack of 5 is not amazing for crossbowmen, that's actually comparable to the peasant archers, but remember they are on horseback so you can't expect too much. A 7 attack 10 defense is not amazing, but again, missile cavalry you can't expect too much, um, but obviously they're not going to compare to the likes of these guys, that would be overpowered. Now, in terms of siege equipment, I've discussed that before in the England faction guides. If you want to have a listen to that, go to the England faction guide. I just don't want to repeat it for every faction. That would be a little bit boring. But I do want to talk about the... I am actually part Italian, so I should be able to pronounce this. I'm not going to be able to, though. Condottieri. Was that good? Okay, I know I'm Italian, but any proper Italians out there, if... Did I say it right? I don't know. Armed with a lance and plate armour, these trained and experienced mercenaries are well known for their capricious ways. 8 attack, 15 defence, well armoured and good stamina, pretty solid, particularly for mercenary cavalry. I quite like these guys indeed. They have a cool Italian name, so you know who wouldn't like them? So now we're going to get into some actual campaign strategy, so I will join you on the campaign map. And here is the starting position for Sicily, and I think quite a strong one personally, but, you know, that's just my opinion. Now, we start off with Palermo, which is on the island of Sicily, of course, and you own the whole region, so that's nice and good. So Palermo, capital, Prince Simon, that's a very Italian name, isn't it? Yeah, and then Alberto um, is over there as well, so very good stuff. Yeah, I really shouldn't be doing Italian accents, I'm just a disgrace to my family. So anyway... Um, pretty decent sized force here, and what I like of course about Palermo being an island um, in Sicily is that it's more defensible naturally just by virtue of the fact it's an island, you know, for an army to get over here, apart from at this point which you also own, uh, you need to have a ship, so that's pretty decent. And then Naples, Naples is in, in a nice position because you're kind of protected by the Pope. The Pope and the Papal States is a bit of a buffer zone towards all the other nasty Italian factions. Now, what I would recommend... Here's, there's a couple of things I'd recommend. Let's talk about, first of all, where I'd go first. It's quite nice, and some people will disagree with me, it's quite nice to get the islands early on, okay? It's quite nice to get, because I believe this is a rebel settlement, if I'm correct. Yeah, Cagliari. It is indeed rebel, and it's not got a big garrison, so you don't have to expend a lot of force taking it. Now, if you don't take it, somebody else will, probably the Moors, okay? If you don't take it, somebody else will, and it's quite nice just to take early on. Now, the Moors likely will try and again and again take it, so you could argue that that's an annoyance. But, oh, I forgot to turn off the Fog of War. Wait a minute, I'm a very professional YouTuber. So, I'm going to turn off the Fog of War. Um, I don't play with the Fog of War off, but just so you can see what's going on. That would probably make a lot more sense. Yeah, so taking Cagliari and Ajaccio... A is that this is Sardinia and Corsica, right? I think so. Taking Sardinia and Corsica, I would just do early on because two settlements on an island, so you've got good access to trade, which is really going to help your economy early on as well. You can have a really big economy because you've got such good access to Mediterranean trade routes. Um, that's what I'd go for first. If you don't take them, France, Milan, or more likely the Moors will take them instead. So I personally would go for them. I would go and take those two. But what I would do as sort of general strategy, well... You could try and charge up here. I would not do that. I categorically would not do that. Instead, I would try and be best friends with the Pope. Just suck up to him a bit, okay? He's going to be your friend because he's going to protect you from all of these people. And you don't want to go towards Milan, Venice, and the Holy Roman Empire at once. And also the Papal States. Not a good idea at all. You don't want to be excommunicated. You don't have a crusade called against you. Instead, be real good friends with the Pope. Give him money. Do all of his tasks and all that. And if any of these guys attack you they're likely 
to call a crusade on them and then they're going to be screwed. They're going to screw themselves over. So they're less likely to attack you. And like I said, this is a bit of a natural buffer zone anyway. Not only the mountains, but also the Papal States is a bit of a natural buffer zone. So you're pretty much safe in the north. Why would you poke the bear when you don't need to? Just leave it. Leave them sleeping over there. You've got the Pope to protect you if necessary. Instead, why not go for Tunis, which is also a rebel wooden castle only four garrison in there so that's quite a nice one to take as well early on also with mediterranean trade routes and i would personally go for the moors now it's kind of up to you you could expand into direction tripoli is only one settlement so you'd have to travel a long old way to do that and then you could eventually go to war with egypt the problem with that is you've got the moors that would be coming over at sorry the moors the um the mongols would be coming over at some point and going to war with Egypt can be tricky because maybe a, a crusade would be called. But it would kind of be nice if a crusade was called that you already had an established force in Egypt. And then if a crusade for Jerusalem happens, it kind of just sinks in well with your general plan to expand in this direction anyway. So you could go for Egypt, but it depends how scared you are of Mongols, basically. If you are scared of Mongols, then go for the Moors because it's probably easier to go for the Moors, but less rewarding in the long run, I would say. The good thing about going for the Moors is if you are managing to uh, reach there, you can get to Timbuktu and they have lots of gold and lots of money. Okay, You build gold mines and stuff in Timbuktu, you hit the jackpot, you're rich forever. So I would say maybe for economic purposes, and if you don't want to fight the Mongols, expand in this direction if you want to progress with the campaign maybe more efficiently and also get access to some really cool settlements over here and also be in a nice position to crusade and all that if you're more into that then i'd go for egypt this is probably an option for more experienced players this is probably an option for less experienced players even if you are experienced personally i would not go up here it is a complete mess what you can do though when you're in a really strong position is if a force does dare to attack you, the Pope will absolutely screw them over and then you can go and say, I'll screw them over as well and take advantage of that. Take advantage of the fact that also all the other factions will be hungry to kill them because they've probably been excommunicated. That's my sort of general advice on that matter. But that's all I've got to say really. I would personally go south and then you've got an option of turning left or right. I would, me personally, I'd probably go for the Moors but you are perfectly obliged to go for the Egyptians as well. Depends if you want to fight some Mongols. So that basically is the faction guide for Sicily. I think the next one's Milan. That's not a promise. I can't remember what I actually promised on in the comments. But I think the next one is going to be Milan. But anyway, it will be soon anyway. So thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you around.